Hello and welcome to our Thursday nights together for the conversation. It's been fantastic over the last eight weeks now to talk to those from the arts in so many creative industry fields. And it's, you know, for me, it's that chance to really get into a person's idea of what makes them tick when it comes to what they do. And tonight, uh, the words distinctive, versatile, an international reputation across all creative mediums. He's a musician, he's a composer, he is Nitin Sawney, and we welcome him to the conversation tonight. Hello. How are you doing, you right? Really good, Nitin. Thanks so much for being with us. Um, I think for, for a lot of people, I think that word uh, distinctive and versatile probably is what pops into their mind because you do seem to work in so many different areas, but you seem to master them too. Sometimes people spread themselves into lots of different areas and they don't quite have that ability. Uh, for me, I know the word passion comes to mind. You just love what you do, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I've just kind of always been playing music, so it's it's just kind of part of my nature. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I guess it's kind of the way I prefer to speak, you know, rather than use my voice. Um, I, I, I kind of, um, I guess it kind of feels like a more natural language to me than anything else. Yeah, the, the language is an interesting one because you and I have chatted in the past about how music seems to be able to translate. And I said about an international reputation, that's because you also want to reach out. You want to bring the world in. And I, I think that's really interesting. And, and music can do that, can't it? Yeah, I mean, music, well, this is the thing. I mean, you know, the, we say music is a universal language because it is. It breaks down all boundaries. It can uh, transcend every barrier because it's the language of emotion. And that's the thing. It's, it's, not, um, it's not kind of, um, I suppose, subject to the same constraints as normal ways of speaking to each other or normal kind of modes of conversation. So I, I think... I mean, you know, I, I discovered this once when I went to South Africa and I went into um, a little place in Soweto and uh, and there were I'd been told that it was quite a dangerous place to walk into. So when I went there, it was quite um, it was quite unnerving because, you know, I, I heard this that it had a reputation of people walking in and getting shot. Um, but I went in and I went in with one friend and uh, and we went through um a small kind of village area where people were actually really lovely. And I sat down and I just saw, I saw one guy just playing, um, uh, playing a set of congas. And, uh, and I just kind of sat down and just kind of watched him and he kind of watched me and he just kind of handed me a drum and I just kind of started playing with him. It was just literally just that, that simple. And then he started smiling a lot and we, we were kind of jamming for a while. And then all these people came round and started bringing us food. <laughs> and um, and I remember one person said, you play like a local. And that was just brilliant because suddenly the, all the barriers had gone down and it was just really, you know, it was just a really friendly atmosphere and it was just really nice. And I, I think that was the moment where I thought, God, it's amazing, isn't it? Just like rhythm, just a connection through through rhythm or through something that, you know, that, that kind of makes us happy, um, just breaks down any kind of other barrier of kind of um, of suspicion or fear. Just out of interest, when you were then with that group, when you left, what was that like? Because when you leave a place like that and you have that amazing, enriching experience, I, th I think sometimes it's really hard to then leave. Yeah, yeah, well, it's true, actually. Well, they were, didn't they didn't want me to leave, which was really nice because they, they, they literally were treating me like a special guest and it was just beautiful, you know. And like to, you know, I remember they were, they were just kind of give, bringing me all this food and kids were coming up and kind of, you know, it was just fantastic. And But, I mean, that's happened in different circumstances as well, you know, connecting with um, Aboriginal Australians, particularly one guy um, who's now passed away, a tribal elder in Arnhem Land, um, but he was, it was amazing because I, I, connect, I connected with him playing the guitar um, on a sacred land that we kind of both sat on uh, together. And, um, and he told me these old stories about uh, the history of his tribe, uh, which was incredible, or, or of his clan. And, um, and I really, I thought that was quite powerful. But, um, but yeah, when we were playing the guitar together, we, we would stop at the same moments just automatically or we'd have some kind of a weird connection that, again, 
I don't think you could put that into words. It was just mm. it was just an intuition, and we could kind of feel each other's energy, you know, through through the way we play music. I don't think you can really do anything like that um, outside of music, not in the same way, anyway. Yeah, I, I think I, I love that though. I think that ability to communicate in that way and and to to have an almost understanding about each other because you are hearing those sounds. I mean, you've described to me in the past, and I wonder if we could talk a bit about that, about how that central kind of idea of music, where, you know, we're after 11, so you and I can get a bit sort of earthy about this, but, um, you know, that sound of om, you know, that, that, that first universal sound, I think there is something deeply to be said about that. And I know that I feel it when I go in my car and I turn on the radio or I listen to different genres, there's some things that, that a piece of music sometimes can completely captivate you on a different level than just hearing it with your ears well it's very interesting you should say on a different level than just hearing it with your ears because i've been you know last year i i wrote an essay for radio four about beethoven and in 1840 and uh, 1816 when he was 46 years old he he had pretty much lost all hearing in his ears and um and so you know he he was he was um, at that time writing or copying uh, scripture in Hindu scripture, and he would write down certain words from Hindu scriptures. And it was quite interesting because from then on, he wrote his greatest work. And so, the, the, what was he listening to? And mm. I kind of the reason I say Hindu scriptures is because there, there was there's a sense of him connecting with something, an inner self, which I think in ancient Hinduism, you know, there's there's a lot of of that idea of of kind of connecting with your inner inner self and um, and uh, you know through meditation or yoga or other other techniques and um, and I think that he found some kind of spiritual pathway to hearing music without actually having anything physically you know um, being able to hear it literally yeah. so so I think there's something there's something in that you know that somebody like Beethoven his sense of musicality actually transcended sound itself which is quite an incredible thing do do you remember the first time uh, you know whether it was uh, at a young age I guess you know but the first time where you realized music was something that was more than just listening for you it, it was something you had to do yeah i mean well to to be honest with you i mean i i think uh I think from the first moment I, I saw a piano or I played a piano or, or even just banged on the keys of a piano, I fell in love with that. I fell in love with the idea that I could make, I could create sound, you know, in a way that, that, uh, that I could kind of uh, control and I could, could, I could create frequency that was greater than, than the restraints or constraints of my voice. You know, so that that really excited me, and I I mean I was always thinking that way because I I guess with you know I was attracted to drums and other instruments and obviously the guitar, and, um, but I think piano was the first time I just thought, wow, there's you know there's an incredible, there's a very beautiful connection with this with this massive thing, you know when you're four years old it looks huge and and yeah. it was it was just very it was just very exciting, you know, hearing all those different possibilities of what you could do. And that was it. I kind of thought of it as a blank canvas, you know, when, whenever I touched the keys, you know, it was kind of like, I, I liked the idea of possibility um, more than I did in a way, the resolution of sound. So I would look at piano and I would think, wow, you know, I could create anything with that in the same way as I used to love drawing. You know, I'd look at, I'd look at a piece of paper and think I, I can turn that into anything. And I think it's the process and the possibilities that always attracted me. I was thinking about, you know, over the last year in lockdown where I've seen you uh, on social media with just a piano and it's just your fingers on the piano yeah. and you've just expressed yourself on that. And there was something really beautiful about just just seeing you just enjoy a piece of music and then share it with us. And you haven't, you know, to put the sort of in the music terms, you, there's no bells and whistles around it. It's a, it's the pure sound, and and I, and, and I, I'm guessing that sometimes that I know you'd have to probably do a lot of playing in order to keep what you're doing up and running, but but also sometimes you just want to play. You just want to play. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, I, I really enjoy. It. I mean, I, I I love just kind of sitting down at a piano and and guitar. I mean, I I'm very glad that at this point in my life I haven't got to 
the stage where I feel um, jaded by music. And, and I don't think I ever could or ever will. Um, it's, it's just so rewarding to play. And, um, and, you know, I still will sit and think, okay, you know, today I'm just going to practice lo loads of scales or I'm going to practice arpeggios. And, and I, I get a lot of joy from that because actually there's a lot um, that I've learned from, uh, and Catherine Ann Davis, the anchoress, she was talking about this the other day when she was talking about EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing, where you actually, um, which is a psychotherapy uh, kind of technique, um, yeah that is used with post-traumatic stress disorder and also it's used with um, uh, phobias as well. Um, but the idea of it, um, it's, it's, it's amazing because it kind of gets into your, into your brain. It kind of almost recalibrates or, um, uh, you know, the, the left and right hemispheres of your brain. So it's kind of um, uh, bilateral stimulation, you know, where, where you have, um, I mean, originally the idea was to have alternating light um, and that could actually sort out problems as you were thinking of them and I've, I've kind of found that when I'm playing the piano uh, that when I kind of alternate certain uh, certain patterns between my left and right hands and I'm thinking through problems or, or something that's troubling me I really find that quite soothing so it's kind of you know so in a way I kind of find that there's something still really kind of um i mean in the same way that walking can do that or, or other things but i do find it it's an extra addition to have this beautiful you know these beautiful sounds and and you can create real symmetry and different patterns in the way that you play and that can be really really nice i can really you know i really enjoy that still so powerful but also you know a great opportunity to just as you say you know get on there and 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 have a performance it doesn't always have to be a broadcast doesn't always have to be out there for everyone it's sometimes just for you knit and oh, yeah. for you um <laughs> uh, welcome along if you've just tuned in uh, the, we are talking to musician, producer and composer Nitin Sawney on our edition of The Conversation this Thursday evening. I just thought it'd be really nice as well to look at just a, a snapshot as we do with this new gallery that we've been doing here on The Conversation over recent weeks, looking at some of the work uh, of Nitin Sawney. And this is a tiny, tiny fraction. And we'll just run through some of these moments for a second and then maybe we'll talk more in depth about uh, how this all comes together. But uh, certainly the film composing, uh, more recently, most Mowgli, a, a fantastic project that you were involved with. Um, Midnight's Children, um, just an incredible piece. And I remember, I think, first coming to know about your work with the girl from Mogadishu as a, as a film. Uh, but then there's also the performance. And we can see uh, right at the top of our screen, uh, the Immigrants album, which has just come out, which I thought we could talk about right now. Um, that has been for you... Uh, just something so important in your life to produce this the the official sequel as it's described of, of beyond skin back in 1999 the mercury prize nominated and and um first of all take us back to beyond skin for a moment and when that first came into your mind and then maybe we could then leap forward into 2021 yeah i mean yeah, beyond skin well i mean um so, so uh, what when Beyond Skin first came into my mind? Mm. So, so Beyond Skin was kind of, uh, yeah, wow. I mean, um, I mean, I was I was in my in a very very small bedroom at the time. Uh, I mean, this looks a bit like that, that now. This is kind of like one of the, one of the rooms in my house. But I'm I kind of um, I, and actually in this place here, I've kind of uh, because of lockdown, I've kind of brought some of my studio equipment here. Right. Now I'm able to have this conversation with you here. But um, but I. Um, at the time, I, I had a much smaller bedroom that I was in and very limited equipment. But I I think I was at the point, I mean, I'd already made two, no, three albums. I'd made um, uh, Spirit Dance, Migration and Displacing the Priest. And so I kind of really wanted to uh, make an album that was very personal. And, and, and so I even included the voices of my mum and dad on there. And I had all kinds of interludes on there. And, um, and I was kind of using it to question ideas of identity in re respect of race, religion, nationality. Um, and so there's a lot, there's a lot of that on there. So I, I guess it evolved over the space of about a couple of years. I, I think I started in about 1996 or 97 and finished it about 98, 99. Um, I think it came out in 99 and then got nominated for the prize um, in, in 2000. 
I think it's been really interesting, though, to see uh, with the new album that's come out, how many people are referring back to the previous album with such uh, love and joy uh, that, that they had been part of it. It's almost like you were taking other people on that storytelling you were doing you know and i know that is probably what a composer a, a songwriter a musician wants to do but to really get someone being able to recognize an album for the for, for why it's there i think is really lovely you know it's it's quite an incredible thing to me because when you make an album I and mean, when i made that album it was very it was very kind of you know like i said i was in a very tiny room and kind of you know with my own thoughts and and in a way i was quite uh I, I was it was quite a self-indulgent experience so I would obviously you know I recorded other people and so on and sometimes I'd bring them to the house and, and record them in the living room like the string you know the strings on homelands are, were recorded in in my house at the time um but I uh, which was a shared flat but I I kind of um you know it, I made it work and and the musicians were fantastic and uh, and it just came together. What was amazing was actually going back to it and then performing it in 2019 at the Royal Albert Hall. And um, and then, you know, try, that was the first time I'd, I'd tried to perform it in its entirety, which was an incredible thing to do because it was it was trying to get back into my mindset of 20 something years ago, you know, trying yeah. to try to figure out who that person was again. And then to, to, to make, to, to kind of find my way back in so that I could, rearrange it to be performed live um, and still feel connected to it um, and passionate about it enough to perform it to an audience. So where was uh, Immigrants in, in, in the journey of that? Where, where was Immigrants as a, a, as a sequel? When did it come in? What, where, well, where are we talking about here in terms of... Well, uh... well, yeah, I mean, I think, I think as you, because you came down to the studio in Brixton, I played you uh, the first track, um, which was Down the Road, and um, and I'd kind of put that together. I'd, I'd just been playing around with that idea. Um, and that was obviously before lockdown. That was in 2019. But then I didn't really do the bulk of it until after lockdown. Um, and actually, I did announce that I was going to be um, making the album. And I did announce the title. I did say it's going to be called Immigrants. But I had, I had barely any material at all. So it was quite funny. So I... I and I've done that before where I'll I'll come up with a title and think that's my that's yeah. that's what's gonna dictate what I'm gonna create. And I think I find that quite an interesting way to work because the thing with me is I can go lots of different directions. I love music. I mean I and I play lots of different styles and I, I kind of find myself uh, falling into different styles quite quickly. Um but if I have a title, uh, it means I'm always thinking thematically and I'm always thinking about how you know, even in the lyrics I write or the lyrics that I work on with other people um, and the flavours that I bring in, they all relate in some way to that. And even the people I chose to perform with and, and collaborate with, all of that was dictated by that one title. That's amazing, isn't it? And, 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 and in a way, I mean, I'm a little bit like you in terms of, I'm, uh, as you know, I'm not a musician, um, even though you did allow me to play on some of the instruments in your studio. Um, uh, I... I I, I I often come up with a name of something if I'm making a you know something I do on the radio you know I come up with a name of it because I know that there's something amazing about that that then I build around it I think there's sometimes a, a great joy at finding what the answer is without actually yeah. knowing where you're going um what was interesting as well is you, you mentioned about uh, your studio in Brixton that I came along to and I what's strange now I don't know if this is for you because you're at home like I'm at home um yeah. it's mad to think that in such a short time, everything has changed. But the joy of being in the studio space, are you, um, it might be a silly question, are you missing it? Well, no, because I, I still go into Brixton. <laughs> I, well, you, I mean, you, I, I get I, to I, go. Yeah, I do. I do go. Um, and, and I kind of, I mean, I'll cycle in, um, you know, in the mornings. Um, but I kind of, uh, yeah, so I, I love still going. But, I mean, for a long time, I didn't. I mean, for, for something like eight months or whatever, yeah, I didn't go. Yeah. So it was, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, what I'd really miss is touring. You know, I really miss kind of going out and uh, and, and doing gigs and, and kind of playing to large audiences, which is, which I, you know, I, I didn't realise how privileged I was until that stopped. You know, I mean, you know, it, it got to the point we played the Royal Albert Hall many times and, uh, you know, we've we played the Sydney Opera House and we played the Hollywood Bowl and, you know, played some of the best venues in the world and, and they're incredible places that I love, you know. And and yet I kind of 
you get to a point where you're kind of just doing lots of gigs and you you feel i mean i i never kind of took it for granted but i think i i, I never really realized how much i would miss it so I, I really do miss playing live with and and with the band and touring and you know and kind of having that camaraderie as well of being on the road and and you know it's just it's an amazing thing to tour yeah a lot of artists who you know would be on that stage right now who who are getting ready to go on or whatever you know that that having not having that there really strange so 2021 yeah. uh, immigrants comes out as this new album this week and people are you know listening to this they're maybe linking back to beyond skin but you're giving them something that is a reflection of the world i guess in 2021 uh, yeah i mean i guess i mean it's more yeah it's interesting because i i kind of worked with a lot of people who who had had their own views and their own ways of thinking about that particular subject um and I, I think, you know, I mean, Anna Phoebe, for example, who plays with the band, she's um, of German heritage, but she's also got connections to, to Greece and to Ireland and so on through her heritage. But also then you have, um, I mean, if I just went through all the people, I mean, on this album, they've, they've all got, you know, interesting kind of backstories in terms of uh, in relation to that word immigration. And so, you know, they tell their family stories. Before I would I would write with any of them, um, normally we'd have conversations relating to their experiences or the experiences of their parents or their grandparents or, you know, how they felt about what was going on with with what's happened in the last few years, um, you know. And, and so we'd have these conversations. And, uh, and it was amazing because, you know, very naturally and very gradually, um, you know, music would start um, where conversation ended. You know, and and then it was just a kind of transition into into creating something that would um, purely have come out of a conversation. And I, I, I thought that was really organic and the right way to for it to happen. But that strikes me about you that it is about that. It is about you want to actually know about people. You're interested in the person you're working with. Definitely. Actually, without that. I'm not sure you would do what you do. <laughs> yeah, I, not not in the same way. Certainly not. I mean, I I kind of you know. I mean, there are there are pieces that I write on my own. I mean, for example, the track Tokyo is is written on my own, or even uh, You Are is is written entirely um, on my own. You know, but then I I wrote I scored out the parts for Anna to play and for Ashwin Srinivasan to play on the flute and then uh, on the Bansuri and then. Um, uh, Eva, um, you know, came in and and sung it, and that's the thing—they bring it to life. Even if I have an idea, I I know that the people that I trust will bring the work that is in my head to life, um, even if I haven't collaborated with them. But when I collaborate with them, it's even more kind of exciting, you know, because something emerges that I don't expect, and that's really interesting. And and then to try to think, okay, how does that fit in with with this idea that I have, and how can I make that kind of work? almost cinematically it, with the narrative. And and so I'm constantly kind of um, thinking almost like sculpting, you know, it's kind of almost like you, you have lots of songs, but then that's part of it. You know, I'm, I'm looking, I'll put them into one big, big file so I can kind of see them right. all together. And then I'll kind of switch the order around and I'll kind of, and then I'll bring in these interludes and, and I'll kind of think, okay, How's that? How does that flow? What do, what do I feel when I listen to that? And how does that? How does that make my emotions kind of, you know, where do they go? So yeah, I mean, it's 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 a really interesting process. How much of uh, when you're 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 doing, you've got you've got musicians, you you you're creating these worlds. How mm -hmm. how much of when you're making the album, when you're making a song, making a piece of music, do you you? I always feel like I sound like I'm saying sort of ethereal stuff all the time, but you know, you almost don't know how you got there. It just was naturally happening. Going back to our beginning of our conversation, it just, it just felt that that's the place to go. This jigsaw puzzle of music suddenly just created itself in a way. Have you had many of those times where you just go, don't know how I got there, but it has. Oh, constantly. That happens a lot. And and it is interesting seeing that with, happen with other people I know. For example, um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm godfather to a, a few kids, actually, to um, uh, Anushka Shankar's um, uh, sons and also um, 
and also to um, uh, um, the uh, the son of um, of Sam McBurney, who's with a theatre company called Compliste, and um, their their company is his company is incredible, but. Um, but he created a piece that I actually scored the music for called A Disappearing Number, which was about the life of uh, the Indian mathematician Ramanujan. And I remember um, the first time he put this play on, I mean, we'd been in workshops and we'd been, uh, we'd been in rehearsals and I kept looking at him thinking, how's this supposed to work? This is about a mathematician. How are you going to get people to enjoy this as a piece of theatre? I cannot see it. I mean, it's like it was beyond me what, right. what he was doing. And he'd get people to do things and no one really knew why they were doing certain things. They'd be playing small scenes, but they didn't actually know the full play. No one knew the full play. And then I went to see what he'd done in Plymouth. I, I, I can't, he invited me down and he was frantically moving stuff around and playing with things. I thought, Jesus Christ, this could be a disaster. I have no idea what he's... <laughs> and do you know what happened was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It was just unbelievable. That guy... I mean, you, you know, he's done The Encounter, people who've seen The Encounter, which is an incredible play that he did uh, also for radio, uh, or uh, sorry, online, and he also did it. Um, he performed it all over the place, including at the Barbican. Um, I mean, Complisto is a fantastic company, and it's it's largely his, um, you know, he's, he's written most of the stuff. Um, but what was incredible was just seeing how he could he could take something that was quite, quite difficult and quite inaccessible, which is the idea of mathematics um, for most people, and turn it into something that was really empathic and really beautiful and really powerful and very emotional to watch. And I, I was just stunned by that. And everyone in the audience was stunned. I mean, you know, it was just so powerful. And I, I went up to him afterwards and I just went, where the hell did that come from? How did you do that? You know, and it's kind of... I. I think that sometimes, and this is what I've said before, you know, when Michelangelo said that, that the statues were hidden, hidden in the stone or that, you know, uh, and I've, I think I might have mentioned this to you before, but I mean, you know, that, um, uh, that Col John Coltrane said that improvisation was like a bird that you catch in the air. Yeah. And this idea that, and it's what we're talking about as well, this idea that, that um, you know, music or, or a connection to music or a connection to to something which is artistic is not necessarily created by us, but discovered by us. And that, that you know, that there is something uh, that we're connecting to and we're communing with the universe and that, that true creative spontaneity is being in communion with the universe. And I don't mean that necessarily in any theological sense or anything like that, but, but perhaps in a way where you are kind of, I don't know, just kind of connecting to something that is far more than yeah. yourself. I was talking to a um, I was talking to a sound artist this week about um, he's got a project that he he's doing um, and uh, he was talking about the sound of uh, water coming out of a lock and that kind of rush of sound and I said to him he was playing it to me he was saying what do you think uh, you know and and um, he's got this great project coming up and. Um, I said, it's so funny, isn't it? That that rush of sound that I've known all my life, you know, um, living by the sea, but particularly around locks, you know, and being on canals and hearing that shh and thinking, mm. it's white noise. It's the mm. mechanical, scientific music of white noise. And I love the fact that you, you know, can bring that kind of almost man-made mechanical thing in with a kind of world of the earth, you know, that beauty, that kind of just... And, uh, yeah, I mean, what you're saying is it also is fascinating because white noise connects so much to different aspects of our emotional perception. I mean, when I hear white noise, I can hear rain. I, when I hear white noise, I can hear wind or I can hear the sound of the ocean or, you know, all of those things are within white noise. And, and mm -hmm. you know, and, and so we can hear what we choose to hear within within any sound, you know, and, and that's the that's the other side of how we receive sound, you know, so so there's a lot there's a lot written about that, you know, what sometimes we're only thinking about how we make sound, but the way in which um, you know phase locking and so on in terms of our in terms of our neurology, um, that's quite fascinating when you get into how we are actually um, how we're connecting to sound itself mm -hmm. and how our brains respond. I mean, they've they've done these uh, studies with chimpanzees talking about, uh, and, and, and again, I think I might mention this to you before, with um, oscillatory phase lock, where, where they talk about chimpanzees, um, you know, responding with displeasure to, to dissonance 
in in musical intervals that they get quite panicky and quite upset when they hear music that is kind of um that has uh um you know awkward ratios in terms right. of the in terms of the intervals so and and the frequencies so it's quite interesting because that's kind of a built-in thing you know on, on a on a primeval level that's that's something that is not unique to human beings is that we actually the idea of taking pleasure or displeasure from musical intervals is something that is built into our neurology. So the way in which we receive sound, and that's what I mean, you know, when you listen to something like white noise, it's not just the noise itself, it's actually the way in which we receive it, which is also connected to our memories, it's connected to, you know, to the way in which perhaps we have a connection with something that happened a long time ago that we yes. have association with. And so, so there are so many things, and of course, Music, music, you know, some music we listen to because we feel nostalgic about it, like weddings or funerals or, you know, or, or whatever. You know, there might be an association that we have that is a very powerful emotional experience. Yeah, that, that you know, uh, no, as a radio presenter playing a record and you immediately get a response from someone saying, oh, that takes me back to this. And of course it does. You know, it's, it's so there for us. Um, looking at uh, some of the movie work you've done, I just wanted to touch. Um, we talked about Anna Phoebe, the violinist. You worked with her on Mowgli. I think that was, uh, I, I th seem to recall, was that called the forest scene? Was that right? Or I mean, I brought her in on a couple of different scenes. I can't remember the names of all the cues because there were quite a few. Yeah, there were quite a few. <laughs> Village scene. Sorry, it was it was the village. The village scene. Yes, that's yes, right. Yeah, in the village. This beautiful, just haunting sound that was created with you both. Well, you know what I did was I I kind of brought. I mean, I'd I'd written the melody and I'd written all the parts, but I kind of brought her into play it because I love the sound of a violin. But uh, so she played the the melody that I'd written, um, but but really beautifully. And I I brought in also Ashwin Srinivas, and in the same way I have on you are I really like the combination of Bansuri, the Indian classical flute, and the violin. They work so well together, and it's that east west kind of um, it's, you know combination that I find stunning. Um, but also, um, there's a fluidity in the in the way in which Anna plays uh, that also Ashwin has, but he approaches it from much more of a of an Indian classical um, kind of way of playing, and Anna approaches it from a very you know Western classical way. Yeah. Uh, but she mixes in other influences as well, so so they meet really well in the middle. Um, but yeah, on Mowgli, I mean, she she played. Um, some be I mean, there was a bit um, uh, that I remember writing when Mowgli is in the cage and um, and he's visited by Bagheera and uh, the panther, the black panther. And it's a very, very moving moment because of Anna's violin sound, but also the sound of the sarangi and the sound, which is an Indian classical instrument and the bansuri. But I think Anna's sound really kind of gelled all the other sounds beautifully together. I absolutely loved that movie. And and movie work for you, um, I, I started at the beginning talking about, you know, that, that you're distinctive and you're versatile, um, but music, film, uh, video games, a dance, theatre, you, you pretty much covered them all and continue to do so. But what's that experience as a, as a composer for music, for film actually like? Because you know, going through the different films you've done, you know, they're, they're very different in their in their text. But in terms of, for you, pulling out what you want, I mean, I always think emotion immediately is the driving force for me listening to it. And is that your driving force, emotion? Yeah, you have to emotionally connect with the, with whatever you're whatever you're working with. So th I think that's really important is that you have that connection. And, and that's about, you know, that's about also connecting to the director. So, you know, if you're working with a, with a director, you try to find what their psychological vision is of, of, you know, of the film and you try and find your way into their thoughts and feelings around, around the characters um, and around the narrative. So, you know, it, it, it's kind of a lot less of a, um, you know, it's it's not. You know, when you're making an album, it's a very different process because you're you're trying to find something that comes from inside you, and and you might collaborate with other people, but it ultimately comes from feelings that you have, and you're trying to trying to get everything to work with that. Um, but when you're when you're making uh, music for a film, you're really trying to understand the director and. Um, you know, and really get into their heads um, in terms of how they perceive what they've done. 
I'm going to take some questions, Nitin, because I know that uh, there have been loads that have been coming through, and I, I know we'll look at the clock and we'll be like, right, we must get them in. Uh, but thank you for all the lovely comments that are coming in as well. We really appreciate it. But if you want to put your, if you want to put your message in uh, right now, you t uh, whatever you're watching us on Facebook. Twitter or on our YouTube channel as well at uh, Laughing Frog Productions, then please do. But let's uh, start straight away with um, this question that's come in from Abby. Um, I love being able to connect with people with music and playing piano. What has been the best advice uh, or wisdom that someone has given you within your musical journey, Nitin? Huh, that's interesting. I think I, I think um, many years ago, I, I remember... Um, somebody actually saying to me i can't it was it was when i was um uh working uh, i was improvising and i and i remember meeting somebody who was a lot older at the time and i used to play a lot of jazz and um and i was i was always kind of uh trying to copy all the people that i loved um you know i, I loved listening to their work i mean chick career or herbie hancock or um you know or or bill evans you know with his incredible playing so i was always trying to kind of find you know, how to play like them. And somebody just said, you know, I can't hear you in that. You know, I, I don't know. And I, I think that always stuck with me, is the idea that you, you've got to find your own voice and, and music is an extension of your voice, that it's actually, uh, and, and that was the most important lesson for me that I think I ever learned is, you know, and and so when I'm playing, I, I think um, I'm looking for my own flow and I'm allowing my fingers to find that you know, and, and giving them permission to find it as opposed to dictating or trying to dictate to them what I want them to play. I, I kind of allow um, the flow of my hands and, and the way my hands are to actually tell me what, what, what I should, what I should be, be playing, what I should be feeling. Do you have a particular method that you use, you know, to, to tap into those kind of ideas? Yeah, I mean, I will start off by by playing through scales, arpeggios, doing all those sorts of things, and 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 doing exercises to loosen my hands up. But then, um, then what I'll do is I'll play, you know, I'll play through um, some exercises. I might kind of go through various things. But then when I come to uh, when I come to play, I let go of everything. I let go of any knowledge I have. I let go of everything. But I just you know, it might be, for example, if you're playing through a set of chords that you have in a composition, those chords need to feel like second nature to you. So, you know, I'll only feel uh, comfortable when I really know what, you know, what I'm doing and I know where I'm coming from. Um, I can then let go, you know, and trust my hands. One of our uh, previous uh guests on the conversation actually uh, the backing singer and uh music author tessa niles has got a question for you um uh, tessa herself has worked with everyone in the music business as we found out uh, on our um live stream um with such a vast body of work spanning many art forms knit and is there a project you'd like to tackle that may be out of your comfort zone good question you know, I'd, I'd love to write a full-scale opera you know that would be quite an amazing thing because opera is a it, you know, and when when I say opera, I kind of you know, I'm not talking necessarily in the kind of Puccini Puccini kind of Verdi kind of way. I'm 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 saying that it might be taking the form of opera and and using that to actually create something. I I really find that quite exciting because I kind of I feel like I've done most things that um that I did would have thought many years ago were a big challenge. You, you know, um. I mean, for example, writing for, for silent movies for, for the London Symphony Orchestra or um, a lot of the work that I've done where I, I kind of thought, oh, my God, how am I going to go about doing that uh, at the beginning? But, um, but yeah, I think an opera would, you know, a big opera. I mean, I've, I've worked a bit with opera before, but not, not with a massive scale idea and then creating something that felt like it was a, a huge um, undertaking with lots of, you know, with, with a big cast and with the... Um, you know, lots of, uh, and, and a big orchestra. Yeah, I'd love to do that. And, and what about, you, you mentioned there about orchestras. Do you remember the first time when you were in front of uh, an orchestra of players and how scared were you? Oh, well, in front of an orchestra, uh, as in conducting. Um, yeah, I mean, that was, uh, well, I, I did I did a bit in Singapore um, before I uh, before I conducted the London Symphony Orchestra, but I think that was probably the scariest. Was was actually I mean the thing was 
But I, I mean, if you imagine, I mean, the London Symphony Orchestra is one of the most famous orchestras in the world. And uh, so there I was um, at the Barbican and I'd, uh, and I'd written, you know, the music for a Hitchcock silent movie, which is The Lodger. And I had to, uh, you know, you can't really make a mistake. If you make any mistakes during the course of it, then you go out with the film, you go out of sync with the film. It's very hard to get everyone back in. Wow. So that's quite, quite a nightmare. Um, so... And I had pneumonia when I when I actually did it. So I was literally standing in front of an uh, of one of the greatest orchestras on the planet, um, conducting them. Uh, and I'd had some training with um, with um, Denise Ham, who who's uh, worked a lot with the um, with the Royal Academy and so on. But um, but I I kind of you know it still was a really daunting thing. And it was brilliant because I had such a great response from the orchestra afterwards. And they, they were really warm about, uh, about the, what we did. And, and I've done, you know, and, and I've, I've done a few with them, but as a pianist, so actually standing in front of them was quite a, a huge deal. You love working with fellow musicians though, don't you? I mean, it, you know, so, some people might be quite insular. I don't think you can be doing what you do. Can you, or can you be a bit of both? What, what do you mean? A bit, well, you like, know, almost like you know I, I know that i can broadcast i can be on the radio i can do this uh, yeah. but it doesn't mean that I, i'm not also quite focused and inward looking sometimes in my right. in my craft if i'm editing something for the radio you know I, i'd rather do it on my own than collaborate um i just wonder whether that's a kind of bit of a, a sort of yin and yang for you you know sometimes it's a bit kind of yeah i am today but maybe not yeah. tomorrow <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I think when you are in performance mode, you can't you can't have that luxury, as you know. You know, if you're if you're broadcasting, you've got to be switched on and you've got to be there with the right energy. And it's the same if you're if you're performing on the stage. Um, you know that it doesn't matter what what your what your uh, what's happened before. You've got to be right there and very present. I remember I used to play with a band called the James Taylor Quartet years ago, and I remember um, playing in Bristol on a boat called the Thecla. And I had 103 temperature at the time. And I literally, uh, I had to play on uh, on stage. Yeah, I literally just took my temperature a few minutes before. And um, and I kind of, I literally had to get on stage, played on stage, came off the stage and literally collapsed. I was absolutely dead, you know, afterwards. And it was a similar thing when I, yeah. when I did the, uh, when I did the, I mean, sometimes you can neglect taking care of yourself because you're so immersed in what you're doing. And, you know, that that's happened a few times to me. And I, I try to be a lot more careful now because I think um, I get so I get so totally uh, focused on what I'm doing that I don't actually care about anything else. And I don't care about my own health sometimes. So mm. which is probably and, and certainly that's not the thing. To, that's a bad idea at the moment, isn't it? So, well, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that, that that that's made us all kind of just think, hold on a minute. Are you uh, are you looking after yourself? But but something like this week, for example, you know, you're, you're doing so much. We'll come up to a couple of things you're going to be doing over the next few days. But it's really busy because when you launch an album, I always think it's about it's the same when, you know, I, as you know, I interview actors and, and directors and they do something that then comes out, you know, sometimes six, seven years later or three years, four years later. Yet they've then got to do the circuit of all the conversations about it in order to promote it and make sure it's happening happening um you know I'm, I'm so grateful to you fitting this in because it's just a little chat with you know people watching online. no but that's kind of you but you know but it is it is tiring it, it's a it's a constant thing i'm going to take some more questions because i know that people are going oh no, where's my question uh this is from um oh this is uh Gavin Alexander, I know this uh, one because uh, he is a songwriter um, and he's got some questions here. He's got a couple of questions. I'm going to do a couple of them. Um, would you say that creativity is a wonderful, safe way of exploring darker personal themes? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's definitely, uh, I find it quite therapeutic to, to explore um, uh, kind of darker feelings. I mean, you know, obviously with, 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 the, with albums that I've made, um, sometimes I'll get into into kind of feelings that I've had that are really negative and try and find ways through them. I mean, you know, I, you know, I have, I mean, some of the lyrics that I've written are coming from quite, quite dark feelings about the world and about myself. Um, you know, um, tracks like, uh, well, Dark Day, for example, um, you know, which was on Dystopian Dream. Dystopian Dream, the whole album was really as a response to, as, I, as I've talked to you about again, um, my dad passing away in 2013. So um, so definitely it was very cathartic to make that album, but I don't think um, the album would have, you know, I mean, it came from, it came from a pretty, you know, 
I mean, feelings of extreme grief and, and melancholy. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I, but I think for me, music is a place of honesty and truth. Yeah. And so when you are making music, you can't, you can't hold back, you know, it's, it's who you are, it's what you're feeling, it's what you're thinking. So, um, you know, and if it's not that for me, I, it doesn't resonate with me. I can hear when people aren't being true to themselves when they're, when they're singing or playing music. Yeah. It, it also has to go somewhere, doesn't it? You know, it has to go somewhere and presumably with a, with a, a musician or a songwriter or a composer, it goes there. Um, if you're creating something for a movie and there's a particular scene, I'm sure it must resonate with you about how you're feeling about your own personal situation, about a, a memory from the past, and that must inform the music score. Well, for example, if we if we talk about Mowgli, um, you know, with or, or the namesake which I did for Mira Nair, um, you know, uh, both of them had they were kind of coming of age films. So, you know, Mowgli is um, uh, is in the same way as Gogol is in the namesake. Um, those main characters are coming to terms with their own identity, and and um, Mowgli is is you know he's hitting puberty, and he's kind of, but he's caught between two worlds. And it's the same with Gogol in, in the namesake. He's caught between two worlds, East and West, and, and that happens both times. With with um, uh, with uh, you know with Mowgli, it's more about the fact that he's trying to come to terms with the animal kingdom and the, and humans and try to figure out who he is. You know who is who is his real tribe, and so it's kind of in a way. I guess it's kind of interesting because when I was younger. Um, you know, there were a lot of issues of identity in terms of my own heritage and my context, you know, trying to understand um, the journey of my parents as immigrants and then and then think about, you know, the fact that I went to a school where there weren't, you know, I, I didn't meet immigrants, I didn't meet people who looked like me or, mm. or, or had the same background as me. So it was kind of a feeling of always being on the outside. And, and so when I've worked on certain films, um, I definitely draw on those feelings because... And, you know, coming up with Mowgli's theme itself was was definitely coming up with the theme that felt like it was the theme of an outsider, a theme of somebody who's trying to find their own sense of self. And, and you know, I think when we hear these pieces of music uh, within a film, um, obviously they, they deal with the emotion of the time. But when you then listen to that soundtrack, like many of us do, separately, a whole bunch of other things come into our head. And I think that is fascinating about music's other life, particularly movie music. Um, just uh, back to Gavin with one more point here. Do you think perhaps when writing from inspiration that it's the rebirth of past experiences, which kind of links into what you were saying there, I think? Yeah, yeah, I definitely do think it. I mean, you know, it's kind of... Um, I think it is, but I also think it's sometimes your, uh, you know, it's not always about past experiences. Sometimes it can just be a feeling, you know, and that can that that might be connected to past experiences, but it might be something that feels fresh and new. You know, I mean, um, there there is, you know, there is hope, uh, there is optimism, and sometimes you can connect to that, which which is nothing to do necessarily with past experiences, but to do with a a, a perception of a possible future. So I kind of think um, it depends, you know, it's, it, it really depends where you're coming from. Um, when you're writing for films, um, you have to kind of, sometimes you have to kind of um, hint to what's coming further ahead in the film, you know, and, and so there's a sense of portent, you know, as, as to what might happen in the same way as when you read a, a Shakespearean play, you will actually see, you know, hints at, port of, you know, you'll see portent of what is to come. Yeah. And sometimes you'll do that, with with a piece of music, you're hinting at at something that you know is going to happen as the composer later, but other people who who are coming across it don't know. So you know when you're writing that way. But if you're writing songs, I guess it's kind of um, it's cathartic first. It's getting feelings out, and a lot of that is about past experience. But it's also um, it's also about um, it can be about the present and future. And also when you collaborate with people you're working with other people's feelings too. So it's it's a collective sense of past experience as well. And you're finding meeting uh, meeting places to, to work in. Keep your questions coming in. We've got, uh, it's always, it goes so quick, doesn't it, this hour? 
Um, but it really does. But keep, yeah, <laughs> which is lovely because it means we're enjoying the conversation. But then um, keep, if you've got any more questions, put them in now, and we'll I will try and get to them before the end of this. But I wanted to ask you about. Um, I said it's been a busy uh, time for you around the album release, but also just loads of stuff all coming in like buses knitting, isn't it? They all come at once. Um, let's take a look at uh, something you're about to do, which we're going to see. Uh, this is uh, this Friday, uh, 10 yeah. p.m. Um, later with Jules Holland. Now, tell us about putting this together and Iana Witter-Johnson joining you. Well, it's fantastic because uh, Iana, I've, I've known for a very long time, but she's she's on the new album Immigrants. And, um, and she, I mean, I'd written this piece called Movement originally, which is just a piano piece. Um, and I was kind of, um, you know, as I was saying uh, earlier, I was thinking a lot about Beethoven last year because it was his 150th anniversary. So, um, so I was trying to find a piece of music that kind of drew on him from him, but also Chopin, because I've been playing a lot of Chopin recently, and also Rachmaninoff. Um, so I was trying to bring in some of those influences, but um, but at the same time, I also wanted it to feel contemporary and relevant to what's going on and watching uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and stuff that had been going on. I, I remember chatting a bit to Ayana about some of that, and, um, and she just came up with the most beautiful lyrics and... Uh, an incredible song over the top of what I'd written. And it was just stunning. I was like, wow. And and Anna did the same thing, by the way. She she did it, but more as a classical piece where she played violin. So it was fantastic working with both of them. But um, but yeah, we're going to be playing that live. Um, uh, originally for the album, we recorded it at Wigmore Hall, which was which is such a beautiful classical venue. Um, but yeah, that was that was fantastic. And of course, I've been going to Helicon Mountain, which is um, which is uh, Jules's uh, studio. I've been going there quite a bit recently because I'm um, uh, I've been working with him on his. Uh, I'm producing his new album as well, so I've been uh, working with him quite a bit. And uh, there's some fantastic guests that he's he's got on that album already. And and working on something like later with Jules Holland, I, I've enjoyed uh, when it when it uh, was at the Mason Studio in Kent, where I'm broadcasting from, and where you uh, grew up in the Medway Towns. Um, yes. I uh, uh, I loved going along to the Mason Studio and watching uh, those shows. And uh, um, there's something about that collective of musicians that Jules just curates it so well. Yeah, I mean, he's he's got a fantastic band. I mean, Jules is a brilliant musician. He's very versatile as well. And this is this is the thing. I mean, you know, because people know him for his boogie woogie piano, which he loves playing, which is brilliant. But it's just, um, you know, he's he's written some pieces on this, which are really lovely, really subtle pieces and um, really nuanced. And I, I think he's um, he's such a lovely human being as well, and and really uh, easy to work with. Um, but he's got he's brought in some be brilliant guests on this album, and um, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about them all right now. But um, yeah. you know there are, <laughs> but there are there are some you know some players that I think are are truly amazing. I mean, obviously, I mean just to mention one is David Gilmore, for example, who's um, obviously I grew up listening to him playing guitar a lot, and um, and I I met him a few times, but um, but it was fantastic actually producing a track. That he's uh, that he's playing guitar on, um, but along you know alongside him, I mean, there's some incredible uh, artists. I won't go into all of them now because I think that needs to be a surprise. <laughs> yeah, but it's great. It's great. So uh, yeah, just a reminder again uh, that you can catch Nitten on later with Jules Holland this Friday evening at ten o'clock. And then at the weekend, it just continues, doesn't it? This is uh, this is really exciting. So uh, this is uh, part of the, the globe, isn't it? And, and uh, recorded at the Sam Wanamaker Playhouse. Yes. Um, tell us about this performance and what we're going to expect to see online. I'm so happy with this performance. I mean, anyone who came to the Royal Albert Hall show, um, they'll they'll you know, I, I think they'll really enjoy this. Um, you know, we brought together. Um, uh, I think Abby Samper is is somebody who's who's new and uh, to the band, and she's um, she's singing, um, but she's she's on the album Immigrants, and people will have heard her singing on Differences and uh, and Heat and Dust. Um, but she's an absolutely incredible singer, and she sings beautifully in English as well. Um, so we've got her, we've got Anna Phoebe, and we've got um, we've also got who's obviously a brilliant violinist um, playing with us, and then we've got Eva. Um, who's who's worked with me for for quite a few years now? Um, who sings um, a lot of quite a few tracks in the album, um, and I love her voice. Her voice is absolutely amazing, um, and she just captures the emotion and she nails it every single time. I mean, every single time she performs, 
she's mind blowing to me. You know, um, she I don't know where she draws all this from, but it is absolutely spectacular when you hear her sing. And it's such a beautiful setting. And we've got Arif Dervish on Tableau, who's been working with me for something like 30 odd years now. So um, so it's a great lineup. And um, and and you know it's in the, in that splendid room, but also Anita Rani. I, uh, there's an interview afterwards with her, and she's she's great. So we had a really nice conversation afterwards. So yeah, it must have been a lovely experience, though, mustn't it? Just performing yeah. together. I can't, how how on it? Did you just all take a moment to just look at each other, going? <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was really nice. It's really lovely, you know. And that's the thing, because like I said, I mean, you know, it's it's so difficult if you're a musician who's used to bouncing ideas and, and and feelings and kind of and uh, and sounds off someone else um you know if 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 that's taken away from you it's like losing a limb you know so so when you when you're um working with musicians that you you absolutely have massive respect for and whose work you you really think is is pretty amazing like like Anna or, or Abby or or Eva and Arif as well you know it's just fantastic being on stage with all of them so uh, taking place across the weekend. Yeah. And uh, if you'd like to find out more details on that, um, go to momenthouse.com forward slash knit and sawney. That's momenthouse.com forward slash knit and sawney. Um, our time is almost up. It's been an absolute joy uh, having you on with us. Thank you so much. And you complete, well, thank you. You complete uh, our eighth episode and uh, our first season of these conversations. And I really appreciate you being with us. I wanted to ask you, um, all the things we've discussed tonight, and we've only really touched the surface of, of, of the work you've done. I mean, I even heard your music today yeah. on a TV commercial for a, uh, a very famous um, company that uh, may or may not be uh, a fruit. And, um, you know, there's, <laughs> there, there's, something, there's something wonderful about the, the life of music, actually, Nitin, isn't it? That, that you create it. It comes from your mind. It comes from your feelings and your thoughts. And then it becomes out there into the world knowing that you've got all these bits of music that you've created, all these places that's there, that must also feel a bit of a responsibility that this music is out there. And, and I just wonder how you just kind of, do you just put it, do you put it in a compartment? Do you put it on a shelf? Where, where does it go? Yeah, I mean, I do, I do feel that there's a responsibility about that because I, I kind of feel quite strongly that, you know, that you're curating, uh, you're curating your work the whole time. You don't, you don't, you always want to, make sure it's um, it's taken care of in the right way. And that's something I do, yeah, I do feel strongly about, but I'm really happy. I, 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 the, the thing you talked about, I thought was quite fun. So I was really happy with how they used it. Really good to have you with us. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, beyond all of this, can you give us a little insight into what might be coming up next for you? Because you talked about doing your ongoing producing work, which we didn't get a lot into tonight, but what, what's coming up? Well, I mean, we are, we are um, playing, um, I mean, this is the thing, because at the moment we're booked to play the Cheltenham Jazz Festival and also um, uh, a few other things, but now I don't know what's going to happen. But but we've got, uh, in October the 29th, we are booked to to play the Royal Albert Hall again. Um, but also on top of that, uh, we've got, um, I'm, I'm curating a whole week there, which is called Journeys, and I'm going to be bringing in uh, other musicians during the course of that, including Ava Waves and including uh, Manu Delago and also Shimit Dutta, um, who are going to be performing in the Elgar Room, and then um, and then the following year. I mean, next year we're we're uh, we're touring, um, and we're going to be playing the Roundhouse in Camden, and wow. just touring up and down the country. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Yeah, getting back on the road again. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, God, I miss that. <laughs> Knit and take care. Thank you so much. Yeah, cheers, mate. Thanks a lot. Oh, wow. Nitin Sawney. Uh, real, really great to have him on with us uh, on the conversation. And thank you so much for being part of our show over the last eight weeks. Just a reminder that you can subscribe to the conversation by going to Laughing Frog Productions on YouTube. And you can catch up with all those conversations we've had over the last eight editions. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, these conversations. I hope you have too. And if you've got any ideas of, you know, thinking god it'd be really nice to hear from someone from a certain field then please do get in contact with us uh, here is uh, the email which is laughingfrogproductions at gmail.com nitin sawney uh, was our guest tonight on the conversation we will be back soon uh, taking a break that was season one uh, we will come back and do more but uh, from me for now to you thank you so much for for watching and uh, yeah 
Good morning to you, because it's now Friday morning. Thank you for staying up late. It's been great. We've really enjoyed it. Take care and speak very soon. All the best. Thank you.